recording. Today, we'll look at different interpretations of the nature of human language. Let me begin with a rhetorical question. What can be more natural than talking? Breathing, perhaps. Yes, you talk as you breathe. You don't have to think about it. In your day-to-day -day life, if you want to say something, you just open your mouth and this clever mechanism or producing meaningful sounds starts working on its own. And this miraculous mechanism is called human language. But when you ask yourself a question, how does it work? You will find that it is not so easy to answer. Very many important people in philology, psychology, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, neuroscience and linguistics asked this question and created various theories trying to discover the nature of human language. But why is it so important for scholars to discover the nature of human language? Any ideas? Probably because language is a capacity specific to human beings. So, since language capacity is unique to humans, discovering what human language is stands very close to discovering what human nature is. So, this is the plan of the lecture. We'll discuss unique status of human language, dual nature, of human language that makes it unique. Since basic assumptions about human language differ in regard to theories about the origins of language, we'll talk about language origins and then we'll consider two basic visions of language, structuralist, which is also called formal, and functional. Considering the axiom of conventional origins of linguistic sign put forward within the structuralist approach, will also pay attention to the alternative view of motivated natural origins of linguistic sign. And after that, we'll take a brief look at the framework of cognitive linguistics within the functional approach. And in the end, hopefully, we'll come up with some conclusions. So, what makes human language unique in comparison to other forms of communication, such as those used by non-human animals? Communication systems used by animals are closed systems that consist of finite, usually very limited number of possibilities to express a limited number of ideas. In contrast, the communication systems used by humans are open systems that allow humans to express a vast range of ideas using a finite set of elements. This is possible because human language is based on a dual code in which a finite set of elements that are meaningless in themselves, like sounds or letters, can be combined to form an almost infinite number of larger units of meaning, like words and sentences, to express an infinite range of ideas. For example, in English, the number of sounds is around 50, almost equally divided between consonants and vowels. These sounds are meaningless in themselves, but being combined in different ways to form words, they give us different meanings. Thus, putting together the sounds, s, e, t, we get the word set, and replacing the first sound in it, we get many different words with different meanings. Said, get, let, met, wet, net, pet, jet, fat, and so on and so forth. As for language origins, we begin with the fact that most scholars place the development of spoken language with anatomically modern Homo sapiens and estimate the age of spoken language at approximately 60 to 100,000 years. The series of language origins are based on the idea of continuity-discontinuity in development. Continuity presupposes gradual and cumulative growth, 
like the growth of a tree. Discontinuity views development as passing through stages that are qualitatively different from each other, like caterpillars turning into butterflies. Continuity-based theories of language proceed from the assumption that language is so complex that one cannot imagine it simply appearing from nothing in its final form. So, they assume that it must have evolved from earlier pre-linguistic systems among our pre-human ancestors. The opposite discontinuity-based viewpoint is that language is such a unique human trait that it cannot be compared to anything found among non-humans. Therefore, it must have appeared suddenly in the transition from pre-hominids to early man. The debate of continuity-discontinuity is interrelated with another important issue that shapes language theories, that is, the nature versus nurture debate. The nature versus nurture debate concentrates on the following question. Is language an innate faculty, that is, genetically encoded in humans, or a socially learned tool of communication? Continuity-based theories are held by a majority of scholars, but they vary in how their authors envision this development. Those who see language as being mostly innate, as for example the American psychologist Steven Pinker, hold that the human faculty for language is an instinct, an innate behavior shaped by natural selection and adapted to our communication needs. Those who think that human behavior is a combination of both nature, genetics and nurture, environmental conditioning, such as an American psychologist Michael Tomasello, see language as a socially learned tool of communication, having developed from animal communication in primates to assist in cooperation. The most prominent proponent of a discontinuity-based theory of human language origins is an American linguist and philosopher, Noam Chomsky. He claims that language is an innate mental faculty having appeared as a result of some random mutation. Chomsky proposes that some random mutation took place maybe after some strange cosmic ray shower and it reorganized the brain, implanting a language organ in an otherwise primate brain. Probably realizing that it sounds very much like a fairy tale and cautioning against taking his story too literally, Chomsky still insists uh, that it may be closer to reality than many other fairy tales that are told about evolutionary processes, including language. Now that we have looked at the theory of language origins, let's consider different visions of language. First, we'll look at the structuralist approach where language is seen as a formal symbolic system. This view was introduced early in the 20th century by the Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure and it still remains one of the most influential in linguistics. According to this view, language is a closed abstract system of signs governed by grammatical rules of combining the signs to communicate meanings. Every sign has two inseparable sides, like a sheet of paper. One side is the signifier, that is the shape of a word, the sequence of sounds if the word is spoken, or the sequence of letters if it is written. The other side is the signified, that is the concept or the image of the object that appears in our minds when we hear or read the signifier. For example, when we hear or read the word tree, we get the image of a tree in our minds. According to Saucer, there is no direct connection between the shape of a word and the image it brings about. There is no reason why the letters T, R, E, or the sound of the word tree 
produce exactly the image of a tall plant that has a thick wooden stem and many large leafy branches. In scientific terms, this connection is called arbitrary, based on chance rather than reason. This arbitrary connection is believed to be a result of convention. Convention basically means that speakers of the same language group have agreed and learned that certain matters or sounds evoke a certain image. But when you start thinking about it, this concept of linguistic convention seems rather shaky. It is next to impossible to explain how people could agree about meanings at the time when they had no tool to come to any agreement as language was just in the process of development and no connections between shapes and meanings have yet been established. But still, the assumption of conventional nature of linguistic sign is accepted by the majority of linguists as one of linguistic axioms. Though, of course, there are linguists who do not share it, one of the scholars who promoted an alternative view is a Ukrainian philosopher and linguist of the 19th century, Alexander Potebnya, who was professor of linguistics at the University of Kharkiv. Alexander Potebnya claims that linguistic meaning is motivated. In, all, in other words, there is natural connection between the sound of a word and its meaning. The motivation is prompted by the emotional experience of a person resulting from his or her interaction with some object of reality. This emotional experience comes out in a sound uttered in course of this interaction and expressing this experience. But the sound can only become a word if it is heard and repeated by another person who is also involved in this interaction. And not only should it be heard and repeated, but it should also cause some action by another person, and this action should be noted by the speaker who produced the sound. Alexander Petebna explains these complicated ideas with a very simple example. When a Ukrainian child is hurt by some object, she produces an involuntary sound like vava. So that this Ukrainian interjection could become a word, this child should hear the sound repeated by her mother and see the mother's action caused by this sound, like removing the object that caused the injury. Then, with time, when the child hears the sound again, she will remember the first sound and the pain and then the object that caused the injury. And this interaction of emotion, sound and action, with two or more people being focused on the same object, motivates the connection between the sound of the word naming the object and its meaning. But let's go back to Sosa and see how his ideas influenced for the visions of the language. Sosa's view of language stresses that human languages can be described as closed structural systems consisting of rules that relate signs to particular meanings. Proponents of Saucer's view of language have advocated an approach which studies language structure by identifying its basic elements and then by presenting a formal account of the rules according to which the elements combine in order to form words and sentences. This approach was called structuralism and it remains foundational in linguistics. Now, let us see how structuralist ideas account for communication. To explain the difference between language and speech, Sosa draws an analogy to chess. He compares language as a system to the set of chess figures, each having its meaning for the players and a set of rules for playing the game. Speech is compared to the moves that an individual chooses to make the individual's preferences in playing the game. This idea underpins the so-called code model of communication. 
It is an assumption that people understand each other through codifying and decodifying messages contained in linguistic signs as if they were containers with meaning. To be able to communicate, people have to know these correlations between forms and meanings of language signs and the rules of combining them to express all kinds of ideas. But if it was so simple, would it be possible for us to understand figurative language, like for instance irony? When you say to your friend, oh great, now you have broken my new camera, do you really mean you feel great about it? Just the opposite. But how does your friend know that you feel bad? Not from decoding the words, of course, because the words mean exactly the opposite. What I'm driving at is that structuralist view of language cannot account for interpretations of utterances which involve more than just decoding meanings enclosed in words. Such accounts can be given within functional view of the language. If structuralist theories seek to define the elements of language and describe the way they relate to each other as systems of formal rules, Functional theories seek to define the functions performed by language and then relate them to the linguistic elements that carry them out. Language is seen as a system of communication that enables humans, humans to exchange verbal utterances, to express themselves and to manipulate objects in their environment. But... I want you to look at one specific framework within functional approach, which is called cognitive linguistics. Cognitive linguistics is a relatively modern school of linguistic thought that originally emerged in the early 1970s out of dissatisfaction with structuralist approaches to language. Cognitive li linguistics is also firmly rooted in the emergence of modern cognitive science. Among eminent cognitive linguists, one can name Ronald Lenneke, George Lakoff, Jill Fauconi, Charles Fillmore. As a functional approach, cognitive linguistics attempts to account for the functions of language and how these functions are realized by language system. However, an important reason behind why cognitive linguists study language stems from the assumption that language reflects patterns of thought. Therefore, to study language from cognitive perspective is to study patterns of work of human mind. Cognitive linguists claim that language offers a window into cognitive function providing insights into the nature, structure, and organization of thoughts. Meaning encoded in language, semantic structure, is viewed as partial and incomplete representation of conceptual structure. Conceptual structure is multimodal. It is underpinned by information derived from our sensory experience involving all the five sensory channels. Besides, conceptual structure also relies on our introspective experience involving reflection on our inner bodily, emotional and mental states. Semantic structure lacks multimodality, being specialized for expression via spoken or written symbols and restricted to information derived from two channels. According to one of the prominent proponents of this approach, the American cognitive linguist Mark Turner, when we understand an utterance, we in no sense are understanding just what the words say. The words themselves say nothing independent of the, independent of the richly detailed knowledge and powerful cognitive processes we bring to bear. Cognitive model of communication accounts for the cases that cannot be accounted for by the code model. According to the cognitive view, meanings are not decoded ready-made, but they are construed in the act of communication. 
A body of the conceptual content associated with a language unit used by the speaker in the act of communication is regarded as a prompt which provides raw material for the process called contextualized interpretation, that is, an area of cognitive operations construing meaning within specific context and against the background of rich knowledge which are based on our experience a body of conceptual content associated with a language unit used by the speaker in the act of communication is regarded as a prompt which provides raw material for the process called contextualized interpretation, that is, an area of cognitive operations of construing meaning within specific context and against the background of our rich knowledge based on our perceptive and emotional experience of the world, our cultural expectations and also our experience of construing similar meanings in similar situations or observing other people doing it. Besides, meaning construal is also influenced by the immediate perceptive and emotional experience we gain in the act of communication. Going back to the broken camera example, we can say that the friend who broke the camera is able to understand the message only because he or she relies on the background knowledge which tells him her that nobody can feel great at watching their expensive gadget fall apart. Besides, this interpretation will be prompted by the non-verbal behavior of the camera owner reflecting his or her negative emotions through specific intonation, facial expression, characteristic gestures. Thus, interpretation of a relatively simple utterance is the result of a considerable number of background assumptions based on our knowledge of the world and also our perceptive and emotional experience. So, we have briefly looked at the two different models of language, which represent two different visions of its nature. It's up to you to think it over and come to your own conclusions which one has more potential for explaining linguistic reality, and maybe also human nature. Since we have just scratched the surface, there is a list of literature that you can use in your further investigations of the subject. Thank you for your attention.